Well, thank you so much, ladies. We enjoyed that, didn't y'all? I uh, just want to uh, make sure you know, I, you'll see me on my phone from time to time, and I, I'm not on my phone. I'm communicating with uh, Aaron uh, up in the top. He'll say, what's the name of your message? Uh, turn your mic on. <laughs> Stuff like that. And so uh, used to be the preachers had these telephones up to front. You remember how they pick up the phone? You always wonder who they're talking to. But... Uh, but uh, we're able to do that back and forth, which is very helpful because many times I don't have a mic on, and, uh, and uh, I'll get up here and find out then that I don't. So they keep, keep it squared away up there. Uh, let's open our Bible. 2 Corinthians, if you would, chapter number 5. We've been uh, the last two weeks looking at uh, how God identifies his people. And what I mean by that, God has chosen names uh, that he's designated to his believers, uh, which gives us some insight on what he expects out of us. Uh, it's a great uh, way to learn our duties and responsibilities. And so we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 tonight and focus on the term ambassador. Now, this will be the only designation that God did not himself say, the Lord called you an ambassador. What it is, is the Lord by the Holy Spirit communicated to the Apostle Paul by the inspiration of God in the fact that Paul labeled us and himself as an ambassador. And that's what we're going to be viewing in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. But the word ambassador uh, is well used in the Bible. In the Old Testament, it's used on a continual basis. Let me just give you some references and uh, read verses quickly to you. No need to turn there, but in the book of Isaiah, chapter 18, 2 says, A wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is help. In Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 4, that sendeth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters. So it's an ancient word. In Isaiah 33, 7 says, For his princesses were at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Hanes. In Jeremiah 49, 14 says, Behold, their valiant ones shall cry without. The ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. And in another place it says in verse 14, I have had a rumor from the Lord and an ambassador is sent unto the heathen. And so that concept of being an ambassador ought to help us know how we ought to live our lives in this world. Now, uh, the ambassador has been uh, defined by a variety of places in the secular world. If you went to an encyclopedia or a, uh, an American dictionary, you'd find that a, a U.S. government ambassador is the president's highest ranking representative to a specific nation abroad. Now, we always know, we hear about ambassador to Sweden, ambassador to China, ambassador to Switzerland. Uh, we've heard those terms all our life. And we, we have to really grasp and, and focus on what exactly they are. They, they do not represent themselves. They represent specifically a sovereign or a government to a particularly designated country. Now that's a, a full definition that can be quickly applied to the term that we Christians are called there in chapter number 5 of 2 Corinthians. We'll read it together, if you would. Chapter number 5 of 2 Corinthians. And uh, it tells us that at verse number 20, it says, For we are, notice this, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead that ye be reconciled to God. And so clearly, Paul echoes what he said in the book of Ephesians when he said, I am an ambassador 
in bonds. A representative designated by the Lord to bring his message and mission to a foreign land, and that's this earth that we live on. We are in a foreign place as a child of God. Uh, this world is not my home. <laughs> and so uh, we journey looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. So we're in a transitional period, but while we're here, we have great duties and responsibilities laid on us. We're not just here to whittle our time away or to waste away or to count it insignificant. We actually have been given a responsibility to do bidding for our king, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. That gives us a real purpose in life if we recognize it and understand it. And so the Apostle Paul dealt with it in the fact that he said, I'm, I'm an ambassador in bonds. I mean, he didn't stop him even when he was in prison. He, he recognized he was still called of God, sent out by God, and given a responsibility by God. And he'll reflect what that responsibility was in the upcoming verses. So what is an ambassador? He's one who represents another. Of course, isn't that what the Lord said when he gathered his disciples there in the end of Matthew? He says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. He didn't say preach your own philosophy. He didn't say preach your ideas. He, see, he said, preach the message that I have given you the gospel of the Lord Jesus. So they were given a, a mandate, a commitment. They were to dedicate themselves. In fact, an ambassador not only is one who represents another, but an ambassador is one who has that great responsibility. See, the Lord Jesus Christ is our ambassador in heaven. He's representing us to the Father. And we are his personal ambassadors on earth. We're representing him to the people. We have an ambassador. He's our intercessor that ever liveth, making intercession for us. And then in turn, we represent him. It's, it's kind of uh, a dual situation to know that uh, before God the Father, there's someone that personally represents us. And takes care of us, intercedes for us, watches over us, keeps us safe, and ministers to us from that right now faraway land. But we're not without hope because we have a place right now being prepared for us by our great intercessor. Uh, he said, I'll go and prepare a place for you that uh, when you come to be with me, You'll have everything ready. And that's what an ambassador does. In fact, one definition uh, that I got out of one of these dictionaries, it says uh, that uh, one of the great responsibilities is to have skills in negotiation. Another responsibility is have patient tenacity to accomplish the nation's goals that you're representing. Now, when you think about in America, our ambassadors, uh, you're hoping that the one in China right now is stepping up to the plate and trying to do our bidding. Uh, it's looking shaky, is it not? Uh, the Chinese now have got us, uh, you know, they sent our, our uh, Secretary of State over there about a month ago, blinking, and uh, now they sent the Secretary of, of uh, the Treasury, uh, Janet Yellen, I don't know what she's doing, maybe begging that they don't call our currency in. But uh, uh, while they're there, you know, you're saying, well, may, surely they're, they're representing the goals of this nation. I don't know that they are, but that's what we expect them to do. We want them to uh, don't go over there with their own bidding. I don't want them to do their bidding for one president. I want them to do the bidding for the sovereign nation, United States of America. And so 
uh, as ambassadors of, for Christ, uh, we we'll, ought to strive to live a life that clearly states our purpose to the people amongst us. So when you think about Christ being our representative, think of this written in Hebrews. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. For us. I mean, that's a phenomenal thing that the eternal Son of God represents us. I mean, when we get to heaven, listen, it'll be prepared for us. He's already doing our bidding on our behalf. Uh, I think a lot of times we don't fully grasp uh, what's going on there and what he does for us. Now, none of us can represent the Lord in our own strength or talents. We, we, we're incapable of being ambassadors for Christ. I mean, how we, uh, no man can fully know the mind of God. And uh, we can learn his will from his book. But uh, uh, we can't depend on uh, our gift of gab. We certainly can't defend, depend on our analytical mind. <laughs> uh, we have to gain our role as a sovereign representative of a sovereign God through the strength and resources of the Word of God. I, uh, I don't know what to say to people outside what God's Spirit teaches us from God's Word. I mean, you know, a lot of times, folks, we don't actually witness like we ought to because we have a fear we won't know what to say. The truth is, we've got, uh, we have the Holy Spirit of God that the Bible says will teach you and guide you and actually he told his early disciples, which are certainly applicable to all of us tonight, he told them, hey, don't you worry about it. I'll put the words in your mouth. I'll refer and relate to you what you're going to say. Look, I'm not ready to debate some person all the time in false, some false doctrine. I, I don't set, and you don't either, set ready, ready to go to debate some erroneous doctrine. I don't want to live my life keeping up with facts and figures and methods and ways to break down uh, a Jehovah Witness. Uh, but when you encounter one, God will give you the words to say. I've never been caught off guard if you just relax and have confidence in the Word of God. He'll always reveal a direction that you can go in. Now, I don't look for folks uh, who... Uh, portray themselves in these false religious views, I don't look to go find a place to argue and debate with them. Quite the contrary. A Christian really should be seeking after peace and uh, uh, to do his best to uh, dwell in peace uh, as much as possible, as much as life in us, live peaceably with all men. But occasionally you don't have any choice but to stand up for the truth of God. And uh, as I've mentioned before, in the parking lot of this church, uh, you'll get some of the most bizarre uh, teachings uh, on a daily basis if you go out and encounter somebody who comes up and asks for help or seeks money and you get to talking to them. You'll be surprised at all the weird weird, bizarre views you'll come up with. Some people will mesh the Mosaic law with New Testament gospel and then combine it together with some kind of works religion. And, and it gets crazy like that. Uh, then I've met those who claim they were Moses. I saw the other day they arrested a guy down in South Florida who became violent and he told the uh, county deputies that he was Jesus, Jesus Christ. Now, for somebody to even say that, there's something seriously wrong with their mental condition. 
But years ago in that other building, I had uh, Joseph and Mary walk in in full garb, uh, desert garb to the headgear to the long robes, barefoot, uh, been out in the desert. It, uh, it smelled for quite some time. And they, they were bent on, they were Joseph and Mary. I'll never forget, I had them uh, over there in the hallway uh, trying to figure out, well, why are y'all coming in here looking like Joseph and Mary? I mean, it was August, and, uh, and they were just absolute. That's who they were. And I said, no, no, they've passed away. <laughs> Joseph died, and Mary died. Oh, no, 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 you're mistaken. <laughs> I am Joseph. And so one guy was telling me, and he was Aaron, uh, you know, Moses' brother. And he says, I am Aaron. And I said, well, that's funny. I said, I'm Moses. And I was just playing with him, but, and I shouldn't. But I couldn't help myself. The flesh got a hold of me. And I tried to tell him, I'm Moses. And I don't remember the Lord telling me uh, that my brother Aaron was supposed to be in this location at this time. And so it kind of got bizarre. But after... Uh, Hey, one thing about the years, you get, you kind of end up being like them before it's over with. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many, and it, it hasn't quit. It hasn't quit. You go out to try to investigate, you witness to them, and as soon as you witness, as I say, uh, most of them can quote scripture, although out of context and disconnected. They can quote it by the dozens of verses. Uh, and so to try to make any sense out of uh, what they're saying, it's sometimes very difficult. Well, truth is, an ambassador ought to be always ready to properly represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said we're ambassadors for Christ. That's what we're supposed to be. And notice there, if you would, in chapter number 5 and verse number 11, he says, Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences, for, I, for we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our, to, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. So Paul was saying our whole desire for you people is to teach you how to serve God with your heart and not those who want to get you to hold them in high esteem and, and build them up, make them famous. We, we're here to make Christ famous and we are thankful to God that you are understanding it so we can represent the Lord to you. So we can't do it without the power of God. Now, if you're going to be an ambassador in any country, you've got to be a citizen of that country. I mean, can you imagine uh, us getting a Russian to be our ambassador to China? <laughs> it doesn't work. I know that's bizarre and, and silly, but the, the point is made. If you're going to be ambassador of heaven, you've got to be a citizen of heaven. You got to be born again to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. You got to be one of his children. No alien ever represented the king or its government in a foreign land. You just can't do it. You can't do it in the secular world, and you certainly can't do it in the family of God. You have to be on board by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at verse 17 of chapter number five. It tells you, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. To be a true ambassador, you got to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. You got to be born in to the body of Christ. That way I can begin to know who he is, know his will, know his way. So that when I communicate him to others, I'm not just coming up with my ideas about it. I know whom I have believed. I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I am confident in, as a child of God, as an ambassador, that he is the great I am. 
He is the king of kings. I'm not communicating a hippie Jesus. I'm communicating the eternal God. And uh, we shouldn't have any qualms of boldly doing that, confidently doing it. Peter says you got to be redeemed in order to be a child of God. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. To be a true ambassador, you got to be a citizen. And to be a citizen, you got to be redeemed by the blood of of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then an ambassador in any land's got to be above repro reproach. You know, it's odd from time to time, some of these other countries will have ambassadors in America. Several years back, the Saudi ambassador was guilty of a atrocious crime. And they've got a, uh, a law here where you can't uh, prosecute foreign ambassadors. And I think that's probably one of the most foolish laws that we've ever written. What they did, they deported him. But they could have criminally prosecuted him for his uh, immoral uh, act uh, perpetrated on another. Uh, but they didn't. But he was sent home and his country wasn't happy about him at all. In fact, if I recall, he was executed in his country uh, over that deal, uh, Saudi Arabia. So they don't, they don't have too much of a death row over there. Uh, you don't language in, languish in prison for 20 years or 30 or 40. Uh, uh, sentence is executed speedily there. And so he, he was an embarrassment to his country, and it, others have been uh, had poor behavior. But a, a real ambassador uh, of a sovereign land ought to have act uh, their life above reproach. And that's why it says there, uh, all things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Paul said another time in the book of Philippians, he said that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So it's evident, God's plan for his ambassadors, that we should live above reproach. Now that, if nothing else, ought to give Christians reason to be concerned about their behavior. Today, uh, we're taught around the world, in church, that it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, I can't tell you how many uh, denominations and even uh, like-minded churches put the emphasis on don't worry about uh, being uh, in, uh, uh, don't be different. Don't, you draw too much attention to yourself when you're different. <laughs> that it's okay to be like they are. You be like they are to reach them. And of course that, you know what that does? It takes years for that to spin its work. But now that's why the United Methodists has had a great split because they said we're going to be like them, uh, and eventually they were like them. <laughs> or they said we're not going to oppose their activity, and then they became to accept their activity. Now, there's a theology going around right now in churches all over the nation, and this is not Mark Cooleyism. This is an absolute fact. There's a theology called affirmation theology. It's permeating the churches now. And it's over this matter of uh, homosexuality. And what it is, it is to get the church not to oppose homosexuality as a lifestyle. And by not opposing it, you are affirming it as a legitimate lifestyle. And that is being taught in the seminaries of major denominations, including Baptists. And they go back into the churches and that's why all of a sudden there doesn't seem to be, you know, 25 years ago we would have never thought to condone or even keep silent about any kind of sin. I mean, we don't, we're not silent about murder. <laughs> Murder's wrong. 
Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not... Ba-. Hey, listen, we're not silent. Why would we be silent about any sin? The truth is, affirmation theology picks out that sin, and it doesn't take long before you end up with affirmation theology running your pulpit and accepting that which the church would have absolutely fell back and passed out if you'd have said, in 25 years, they're going to be ordaining these individuals into the ministry, open practicing homosexuals. Now, uh, I don't have, honestly, God knows my heart, I don't hate any of them. I don't hate, I don't have any hate. None. I don't hate a murderer. If Look, if he didn't murder me, it's hard to get hate for him. Yeah? You know? I mean, I dislike his behavior, and I think he ought to uh, be uh, given the full extent of the law and its justice and judgment. But I don't go around going, I can't stand these murderers. I mean, if I went and visited in the prison and I met a murderer, I wouldn't go, you murderer, I'm not talking to you. It's not that. But I'll never say it's okay to kill people. And this is why the sexual perversion that's going on in our country actually started by the churches affirming that which they used to condemn. And now it's promoting it. And when I was up in uh, New England last year, hey, I was stunned at the pride flags hanging outside all the churches of every denomination. We couldn't believe it. Whether it was Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, brethren, they flew their pride flag in front of the church. How did this happen? Well, an ambassador like Paul, he said, I'm an ambassador in bonds. (laughs) He was changed. His ambassadorship representing the true God cost him his personal freedom. And from time to time, even in, a, in this world we live in, they'll find an ambassador and throw him in prison. Every now and then you hear one, we got to negotiate to get our ambassador out of jail. Russia's bad about throwing our dignitaries in jail. You know, just, uh, you know, we need to remember to pray for that preacher over there. He, they forgot him when they let Brittany Griner out in the Russian prison. They left that, that pastor. He's, nobody even talks about the guy anymore. And uh, he's been over there for years now. So a real ambassador is above reproach. He lives his life without suspicion. He has, he's not a doubtful or shady character. People know that he's an ambassador by the way he conducts himself. Uh, uh, you know, you don't want to get to the point where people don't know which side you're on. Or they don't, want, they don't know who you actually stand for. Well... He said you need to be blameless and harmless. And, and, and actually, uh, the role of an ambassador is a role of a diplomat. I think also quickly, he denies himself. An ambassador is willing to put aside his own interest to do the will of the king. I mean, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's that's his role in life. He's not trying to live for Paul. He's not trying to live for any. He's saying, I'm living for Christ. I exist for Christ. My message, my mission is for Christ. I know you you say, well, when you go to the grocery store and buy groceries, uh, are you living for Christ? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you represent the Lord Jesus in the grocery store. Uh, that's why I'm careful what I put in my basket. <laughs> you, you know, I've run into some of our brethren that don't, they're not that careful. <laughs> oh, it's for cooking. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't look like the cooking stuff to me. <laughs> that looks like the real deal there. But, uh, you know, you deny yourself. I, if you're going to be an ambassador, you need to be in constant contact with the throne. 
Doesn't do a good. Not, you can't be a good ambassador if you don't know what's going on and what the, the method and myth, mission has been set down. Uh, if you don't get in contact with the Lord on a regular basis, you're not a good ambassador. I mean, what, what human ambassador doesn't communicate with its government? They got hotlines that are directly uh, give them access to the president himself uh, from that foreign country. He must be steady and loyal. In fact, as we said, he, he can be at times suffering on behalf of his role to uh, represent the Lord Jesus. And then also, he ought to be able to communicate in a foreign country. So, listen, it doesn't do me any good to go out here and say, thus saith the Lord, to a bunch of Americans in the South. You can't communicate. <laughs> uh, I pray thee that thou dost not. <laughs> Nobody's going to let, look, if you're going to communicate, you got to communicate by language that can be received and understood. Now, I love to listen to eloquent preachers. But there are times when I try to, I was listening to a guy yesterday uh, from Ireland. And I, he had a good message, but he had cloaked it in such sophisticated language that only a theologian would be able to understand it. And, uh, you know, it, it doesn't take long if you're around this area of the country to know that you better speak plainly. Folks, folks don't pay attention uh, to uh, that which uh, comes across as overly sophisticated. Not that it's wrong, but if you're going to be an ambassador, you better be able to communicate. You better come down out of the clouds and speak to those who you need to communicate to while representing the great I am. That's not an easy thing, but God gives us access on how to do it. So when Paul wrote these words, everybody, uh, he, was writ he wrote them by the Holy Spirit of God, everybody he spoke to could understand what he was saying. Um, notice the message Verses 19 through 21 of an ambassador. To wit, here's what it says. Verse 18 tells us his, his uh, method. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That's what was his method and that was his goal and that was his uh, motive to represent God was to Give them the message of reconciliation in that God died by, the Lord Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and he, he offers reconciliation between God and man. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That's the gospel, the ministry of the gospel. So I don't have to preach on uh, the theology of the vials that dumps out in Revelation. I don't have to preach on the trumpet judgments and go out there and memorize everyone. No, 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 no. The, the thing I need to focus on is the message that we are being sent out by the Lord himself, and that's that Christ died for our sin and that he's offering the free gift of salvation which will reconcile us to God. We who were one time alienated from the promises of God how are brought nigh by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the message. And verse number 20, it says, Now then, well, verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, and Christ said, that ye be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the message. Now, there are some who take that verse and say, everybody's saved. 
And if that was so, why did, why did Paul, he said Christ did reconcile the world himself, but the reconciliation comes by us receiving the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on, the, on his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But there are some out there that preach that everybody's saved because of that one verse. But if that be the case, why did Paul in the next verse say, we beseech you, we, be, we beg you, be ye reconciled. If everybody's reconciled, why is he begging them to be reconciled? Hey, if you keep on reading the context of the verse, the Bible always clears itself up. There should be no, no thing. But there is a group out there today that, that teach salvation by grace, but they teach everybody that's been born since the crucifixion of Christ are all saved. <laughs> hey, uh, not if you're not reconciled. And you're reconciled by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that word ambassador has a lot for us tonight. And uh, we have representation of those who've gone before us. Philip was a great ambassador for the Lord Jesus. He preached Christ unto them in Samaria. And then when he found the Ethiopian eunuch, the Bible says he opened his mouth, began at the same scripture and preached unto them Jesus. That's it. Uh, that's the message and the motive of every child of God as we represent that word, ambassador. <laughs> Let's bow our heads tonight, if you would. For ye are, we are ambassadors for Christ. We're Christians, but that name ambassador also identifies our life. Lord, we thank you for uh, God being clear to us through the word concerning what we ought to be, how we ought to live, how we should conduct ourselves. And Lord, we know that as we look at that word ambassador, uh, we admit that we have failed in many cases representing you like we ought to. Help us to be strong and to go forth and recommit once again to realizing the dignity of the role that you've put us in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.